but we're not gonna call the FBI. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime, Crew Trime, Crew Trime, Crew Trime. Crew Trime. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds good to you, then make sure that you subscribe to this channel right now, hit the bell notification, and then that way you will never miss one of my uploads. So as you know, we are moving across the United States, hitting a true crime story, uh, <laughs> excuse me, a crew crime story in all of the 50 states. And I've been like nerding out over these little facts that I've been finding about the states. And I'm glad to hear that you guys are loving it too, nerds, fellow nerds. Let's see if you guys can guess where it is before I tell you. Today's story comes from the very first state to declare their independence, the home of the nation's oldest carousel and oldest schoolhouse. It's also the site of the world's largest bug, a two-ton, 58-foot-long termite named Nibbles Woodaway. Aww. You guys, they dress him up for holidays. Precious. We are headed to Rhode Island. Today's story was recommended by a viewer here on YouTube named Caroline Prague. Hi, Caroline. Thank you for this terrible story. It's terrible. This is the story of Christopher Hightower. Okay, so I don't really talk about the makeup products as I'm telling the story. So if you are interested to see what I'm using, look down in the description box, everything's linked. Ernest Brendel was born on March 22nd, 1938 in Jersey City, New Jersey to his parents, Jolene and Jacob. This pump doesn't work anymore, okay? I'm down to the bottom. After high school, Ernie attended Brown University and originally wanted to become a doctor. He kind of realized pretty early on that his heart wasn't in it and he switched to law. The point is Ernie was a smart guy, you know, so he graduated from Brown University in 1959 and then he went on to the University of Virginia to get his law degree. When he finished law school, he decided to settle in New York City and pass the New York bar in 1964. Ernie was described as like a guy's guy, you know, he liked to drink beer with his working class friends and regular bars and watch football and play poker. He was, you know, like a loyal friend, like friend for life. He was hired as the assistant general counsel for the Seagram company, Seagram like the gin, you know, liquor. But he eventually took a pretty lucrative golden parachute, like a buyout in 1979. Alice Bob was born on July 9th, 1945 in Reading, Pennsylvania to Arlene and Arthur Bob. Alice loved books. She loved reading. Her room was filled top to bottom with books. Alice was a smart cookie and she was accepted at several top-notch schools, but decided on Brown University because it was co-ed. Well, after graduating from Brown University in 1967, she went on to get her master's degree in library sciences at Columbia University in New York. Ernie and Alice met during some kind of social function at a posh university club in Manhattan, and they were quite the team. If you met them, you just knew that they were made for each other. They really enjoyed having spirited debates, arguing, <laughs> friendly arguing about anything, politics, war, religion. They loved classical music, museums, theaters, and travel. They both loved adventure, so they together traveled to Spain and Egypt. They couldn't wait to have a child, you know, so that they could take them all over the world too. In 1980, Ernie and Alice were married at the Memorial Church of the Holy Cross in Reading, Pennsylvania. On June 27th, 1983, Alice and Ernie welcomed their daughter, Emily Ann. As much as they loved their house living in New York City, they discussed many times that once a baby came, they were gonna need to move to a quieter place to raise a family. So Ernie was the one who was researching the perfect place for them to move to, and he found it, Barrington, Rhode Island. It's a few hours from New York, but they weren't planning to continue working in the city anyways. So after their move to Barrington, they made a few friends, of course, but they mostly kept to themselves. They just really enjoyed and valued their family time, the three of them. As Emily grew up, she had a very active imagination, and she would even write down her dreams and 
talk about them with her friends and make up these incredible stories about castles and dragons with sword fights and duels to the death. <laughs> During the day, she attended ALP, the alternate learning program at the Primrose Hill School. And on Friday, September 20th, 1991, the ALP was taking a field trip to the docks in Newport to watch three Viking ships. The eight-year-old Emily was so excited. <laughs> she could barely sleep the night before. But the big day came and her dad, Ernie, drove her to school. Pictures taken on that field trip showed that Emily was wearing a Mickey and Minnie Mouse sweater, blue jeans, a lime green jacket, and white LA gear sneakers with sparkly shoelaces. And I know exactly the kind that she's wearing. Do you remember these? Do you remember these? With the little twisty leather things? When I saw that picture, that unlocked a core memory. Okay, okay, all right, I'm getting off track, sorry. So that same day, Alice, Emily's mom, <laughs> Ernie's wife, she was going to work at the Brown University Library. You know, she loved her job. Every morning she took the bus from Barrington to Providence, which is like a 20 minute ride. But this morning when she got to the bus stop, she realized that she didn't have enough change for the bus fare. So she walked back to the house and asked Ernie, to drive her to work, and of course he did. Now, Ernie worked from home. Remember, he got that golden parachute, he was doing very well, and he was doing like patent and trademark legal stuff. <laughs> He was quite successful in his work and he also managed him and Alice's finances for a long time, you know, investments, because he was a pretty smart guy. The Brendels were a loving family, you know, happy, perfectly normal, pretty successful, you know, comfortable financially, especially. And they were even planning Emily's first trip abroad to France, but they'd never make the journey. On Monday, September 23rd, 1991, the FBI received a phone call from Christine, Ernie's sister. She told them that a man named Christopher Hightower came to her house in Connecticut the night before and told her that he was a friend of Ernie's and then went into this wild, wild story about her brother and his family having been kidnapped and held for ransom by the mob. Also, by the way, his wife and children had been kidnapped by the mob. Apparently, Ernie had gotten himself entangled. An entanglement? Yes. <laughs> yes. Entangled with the Italian mafia, and he owed them a lot of money. And to be fair, there is kind of a history of Italian crime families in Rhode Island, allegedly. But anyways, Christopher said that he had been contacted by the kidnappers and was acting on precise instructions he'd been given over the phone. He also said that he actually spoke with Ernie, but it was hard to understand him because they had beaten him up so badly that, you know, his jaw was broken. Anyway, the mob had taken the three of them hostage until they got paid $300,000. Okay, well, Christine wasn't buying this story at all. The very thought of Ernie, her brother, getting involved with like the mafia was just ridiculous. She didn't believe this Christopher person for a second. Then he produced some proof. Christopher had Ernie's wallet and everything in it, his driver's license, credit cards, receipts, you know, and he had Ernie and Alice's wedding rings. Whoa. I mean, right? Like, he claimed that he had gone to the Brendel's home and found blood all over the garage, like all over the car, probably from Ernie being beat up. I mean, okay. Anyway, he was telling Christine that Ernie had told him that he was only liquid, like $50,000, but that his sister, Christine, would be able to help him raise the rest of the ransom. Christine was kind of dumbfounded. She doesn't have that kind of money, so like, what the fuck was he talking about? Well, Christopher was like, you know what? No problem, I got you. I can help raise the rest of the money by putting up my business as collateral. I mean, they didn't have a lot of time. The kidnappers wanted a $75,000 payment by Tuesday morning. Excuse me, like, since when does the mob take, like, installments? I don't know, I don't know things. Anyway, he said that they told him that he was supposed to rent an armored car from the first federal national bank in Boston and then deliver the first payment. And at that point, they will release one or more of the hostages, like probably the child and the mother. A couple things, a couple things. First of all, this story is so convoluted. Like what is even happening? Two, you can rent an armored car from the bank? I don't, I don't think that's true. So Christine was like, can we just call the police? Well, Christopher said, no, we can't call the police because the, the bad guys, you know, these mobsters warned me that they would be watching and also your phone is tapped. 
So, okay, well, Christine smelled the bullshit, and I mean, none of this made sense. Also, Italian crime families don't harm women and children. They just make them widows and orphans. What, your father never cut off anybody's pinky? They have a code, okay? So Christine's not buying the story, so Christopher took her out to the driveway to the car that he had driven over to her house, Ernie's red Toyota. He opened up the trunk and it was covered in blood. Also, the back seat had like a white powdery substance. Christopher explained that, oh, that was baking soda for the smell. When did he have time to get baking soda to, I don't, I'm just asking questions. So Christine's husband, who's also a physician, had some thoughts about the quantity of blood in the car. First of all, was it even human blood? Somebody who just had their jaw broken and just like beat up, they're not gonna lose that much blood. And a person who has lost that much blood, probably not alive. Well, smart cookie Christine decided to take some samples of the blood, so she got like some cotton balls and a Ziploc baggie and just moistened the cotton balls, dabbed them around. Smart. She also decided that she needed to get a statement from Christopher and this guy went inside and they sat down together and typed up a statement. When he wasn't expecting it, she took a picture of him. Smart. She originally asked him to leave that car behind. Duh, of course, but there was just five hours of him rambling and telling this like crazy fantastical stories that just got weirder and crazier and crazier and crazier. Finally, they're like, okay, the banks don't open until tomorrow morning. When the banks open, we'll, we'll figure out how to get the $75,000 and we're not gonna call the FBI. And then Christopher left their home at about one o'clock. So they immediately went to a neighbor's house because, you know, maybe the phone is tapped. So they went to the neighbor's house, called the FBI. Now, who the F was this guy? Christopher Jameer Hightower was born on August 20th, 1949 to Margaret and James Hightower in Winter Haven, Florida. This explains a lot. Florida man. What does it mean to be from Florida? Oh, Florida. Straight drill. Just kidding, just kidding. Christopher was the oldest of four children and they lived in a very traditional 1950s family. You know, mom stayed home, dad went to work. When he was 12, he found out that his father, James, wasn't his father, it was his stepfather. Christopher's biological dad ran out on his mother and him when she was pregnant, you know, at age 17. I mean, these days that's a pretty common occurrence, but this was the 50s, okay? So it was very much a scandalo. Well, learning this really damaged the relationship between Christopher and his dad. He was resentful and he held on to a lot of anger over it, Christopher did. He also wasn't really a great student he didn't get good grades in school. He barely squeaked through high school. And in 1967, after he had graduated, he enlisted in the Navy. Christopher was so salty about finding out that his dad wasn't really his dad that after that, he never spoke to him again. What I, what I glean from that is that it just ruined his ideal picture, I guess, of what his life was supposed to be. He cared a lot about what other people think about him. That's dangerous. So Christopher like desperately wanted to change his station in life to become a doctor or marry into an affluent family or whatever it is. He didn't really have the intelligence or the ability to like achieve it on his own. He was incredibly motivated, but lazy, you know, always looking for a quick fix, some kind of shortcut, whatever. He would do everything except the actual work. It was just more important to him to be perceived as successful than to actually do anything to earn it. For example, at one point he was trying to become a doctor. He forged some school records to get into medical school. He had doctored up his transcripts to make his grades look awesome, when in reality he was pretty much failing everything. But let me let me back it up a little bit. Christopher did the brief stint in the Navy. He had a few failed relationships, got married, had two kids, but after seven years, that was falling apart. So the now 31-year-old Christopher was working at a Newport Creamery, like ice cream. And he began a romantic relationship with 18-year-old Susan Slicker. Susan was a local girl, great family, pretty, popular, all that, and she was working at the creamery over the summer until she went back to college in Ohio. See where this is going, right? In 1981, Christopher told his estranged wife, her name was Ellen, that he was going to go to medical school, so they got a divorce. However, he did not go off to school. Instead, he moved in with Susan's parents in Barrington, 
Rhode Island. See the connection here? He was ordered to pay child support for the two daughters, but of course, never paid any of it. Susan and Christopher eventually moved to Dayton, Ohio to attend Wright University. It's the same Wright University that he had forged those transcripts to get into the medical school. Well, Susan was already a student there. Now Christopher was attending. He's there pursuing a master's degree and a doctorate in biomedical studies, sciences, whatever. I don't know how he planned to bullshit his way through that kind of program when you have to like write a thesis and like be smart and all that, but C's don't get degrees in a PhD program. On July 10th, 1982, Christopher and Susan were married at the Barrington Congregational Church. Susan didn't know it then, but she learned later that the diamond in the ring that Christopher gave her had made the rounds. So old Christopher had given that same stone to two other women. He just took it out of the ring and had it reset after each breakup. I mean, good grief, but also thrifty. Their marriage was the beginning of Christopher's acceptance into the community of Barrington. In his view, he was marrying up into the Slicker family. Not only were they affluent, they were a big part of the community because they were actually good people. In early 1985, Christopher finished his thesis and it was accepted, but now he had to pass the written test and verbal test, which were much harder. But then the strangest thing happened, his house caught on fire. Can you believe that? Well, the fire investigators ruled that it was just a terrible, unfortunate accident. No criminal charges filed or necessary. The house wasn't lost. It could be repaired. And the home insurance came through with a really nice check. Christopher spoke with his professors about he, he can't possibly prepare for these really difficult tests. Um, he's dealing with this house fire situation and all that. So they gave him an extension. So this fire remediation is being done on their house. And Susan and Christopher were living in an apartment in the meantime. All of their stuff from the house was just kind of like piled up in the living room of the apartment. And oh my God, they caught on fire too. <gasps> Well, the investigators definitely ruled this one arson. You know, they even found gas cans with Christopher's fingerprints on them. So they brought them both in for questioning, but I don't know how, but nothing ended up coming of it and they were let go. The insurance came through paying an even bigger check and that stuff that was piled up in their living room, don't you just know that somebody stole it all? They just have the worst luck. If you're finding this really weird and hard to follow along, it's because it's really weird and hard to follow along. Just stay with me. Okay, so now there's all this fire drama and Christopher was being investigated for arson. The faculty at Wright University were squinting at him. And when they didn't immediately excuse him from ever taking the tests, he just decided, I don't need this, and he quit. So, re-rack. Christopher now decided he's gonna get into finance. He had dabbled in some money-making schemes while he was in college, so he was definitely interested and he got involved in commodities and futures trading. So I'm gonna do my best to explain commodities and futures trading at a level that I can understand, so like a fourth grade level. Essentially, a person signs a contract saying that they're gonna to agree to purchase an item in the future for a specific price, and the item can be anything, commodity crude oil, lima beans, whatever. So you agree to purchase that item at a set price for no matter what the price is actually gonna be at the future date. So if it's more expensive, then you make money. And if it's cheaper, you would lose money. Am I explaining this right? Doesn't matter. Anyways, well, Christopher had gone to some little seminar, uh, learned some stuff over the weekend and became an expert. So he set up a computer system so he could monitor the stock market. You know, he wasn't certified by the NFA, the National Futures Association, which is required if you want to operate as a professional. Well, instead, Christopher decided to start an investment group. So this group would meet every week at the public library. Obviously he didn't have an office. The investment group was made up of 16 elderly folks, like retirees. They had pulled their money together and carefully invested it. These were not risk takers. But Christopher, Mr. Fast Cash was all about risk, you know, and eventually he was a smooth talker and he won them over. This guy was a really good bullshitter, regardless of the crazy shit we've already heard. Anyways, it sounded like he knew what he was talking about. Well, they named this little group the Investment Guild and the members put in all of their money. The minimum investment was $3,000. So in total, Christopher was working with about like $100,000 of like their life savings. Now over the next six months or so, he would 
in their meetings give them printouts and graphs that showed that the money was doing well. I mean, I have graphs. I have some graphs I can show you. If you pay attention to these patterns here, you can oh. see on the graphs. I made these on my computer. Well, one day, one of these investors said that they wanted to make a withdrawal, you know, of cash. And Christopher says, sorry, we're not liquid. There's no cash. Worried about that response, the investment guild confronted him. Surprising to me, Christopher actually told them the money was gone. That's a switch. Normally these people just like deny till you die, right? So he said, no, there is no money, but he didn't apologize at all because he said, um, I told you this was risky to invest. You knew what you were getting into and that I'm not licensed. So it's not my fault. Well, to keep the heat down, Christopher did take a second mortgage out on his house in the amount of about $22,000 just to like reimburse a portion of the lost investment. But it was no skin off his nuts because he had no intention of repaying it. Because remember, at this point, they're still in Ohio. His wife is still studying at Wright University. He's just left the university. And um, she's about to graduate and they're going to move back to Barrington, her hometown. Okay, so they moved back to Barrington and they moved in with Susan's parents. And at this point, Christopher started the company Hightower Investments. By 1987, he still wasn't turning a profit at all. So Susan decided to go back to work and she took her mom's former position as the secretary at the local church. Her mom had retired. So they are living with Susan's parents in their home and it was working out so well that they decided to buy a house together, aka Susan's parents bought them a house. So Christopher now is fully immersed in the Barrington community. By all accounts, he's an upstanding citizen. He was a Sunday school teacher and he coached the kids' soccer team. I mean, other than the fact that Christopher was bringing in a zero income, life was better for their family in Barrington. It was mostly due to it being the town that Susan grew up in and her family was already established in the community. The office for Hightower Investments was in downtown Barrington and then this is where he met local lawyer Ernest Brendel. Also, the kids went to school together and were friends, and in fact, their families even would vacation together. And Christopher was listed as a person authorized to pick up Emily from school. So this guy was super trustworthy, nothing fishy. They obviously don't know what we know. Ernie and Christopher were pretty close friends and Ernie even loaned Christopher $2,000 for computer equipment for his office. Then after knowing each other for a few years, so March of 1989, Ernie opened a trading account with Christopher's investment firm, but it was surprisingly not successful at all. <laughs> he closed it six months later at a loss. Ernie, the actually successful lawyer, was being a supportive friend, you know? He was just trying to help his friend grow his business. It's like, it's like buying Girl Scout cookies from your friend's kid. You do it, because you're friends. Okay, so in May of 1990, Christopher convinced Ernie to reopen his account after showing him the trading record for the Spaziano account. It showed a $65,000 profit in just four months. I mean, of course that account was phony baloney. Of course, the investment was a failure and Christopher had no idea what the hell he was doing. So in a few months, the $15,000 that Ernie had invested had dwindled to like a fraction of that amount. So Ernie wrote Christopher a really nice letter saying, sorry, it didn't work out. Let's figure out a payment plan for the loan and for the investment loss. But then Ernie also learned that the Spaziano account was a fake. Christopher wasn't just bad at trading, he was defrauding people and Ernie would not let it go. He's an upstanding honorable man, he's a lawyer, right? So Ernie filed a complaint with the CFTC, the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission, which could result in the loss of Christopher's trading license. He had finally messed with the wrong guy. You know, Ernie wasn't a sucker and he wasn't about to let it go unchecked. More so, he didn't want it to happen to other people. So this was bad for Christopher. His business was already dead in the water. So first the computers and the satellite system that he used to run his trading business was all repossessed. 
The landlord was getting ready to evict him from his downtown office, and his marriage was in trouble too, which in Christopher's world meant that he was gonna lose that meal ticket and his social standing. You know, for him, it wasn't about love or family, it was about how people saw him. So Susan asked Christopher for a divorce. When she told him that she was donezo, he threatened her. He said he paid somebody $5,000 to kill her and another $1,000 to make it look like an accident, but it would all go away if she just would stay with him. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure she wants to stay with him now. So Susan immediately filed a restraining order against Christopher. She had him removed from their house. Good for you, Susan. Well, Christopher didn't have anywhere to go. He's barred from the house, no contact with the kids, and that includes coaching, soccer, and Sunday school, all that stuff. Then there was this complaint with the Federal Trade Commission. They wanted to come audit his books because of that complaint that Ernie had filed. <laughs> so what he really needed was to get Ernie to retract the complaint. Well, he asked him many times and Ernie was like, no, dude. How could he make this complaint go away? What if Ernie went away? So on September 19th, 1991, Christopher purchased a Bear Devastator crossbow. Now the rest of this sequence is kind of like constructed through the investigation because Christopher Hightower never confessed and he still denies being involved in this. Since Christopher was so close with the Brendels, he knew their schedule. So while Ernie was taking Alice to work that day, Christopher got into the garage and waited. Some say that maybe he snuck in the night before and waited, but whatever, it doesn't matter. When Ernie got home, Christopher, with that crossbow, fired two bolts into his chest at close range, killing him. He then took a crowbar and beat Ernie's head in to make sure that he was dead. Then, into the trunk of the car, he went. After that, he calmly cleaned the blood off of himself in the surrounding area. Then he drove to Emily's school. Actually, it might have been the YMCA. There was like an after-school program. Either way, he drove to go pick up Emily. When he got Emily back to the house, remember, she's eight years old, okay? He drugged her with Dramamine until she fell asleep, and then he hid her in the basement for some time. When Alice got home from work, she had walked to the house from the bus stop, which was typical. Now remember, Ernie is already dead and in the trunk of the car. There is some debate about how long they might have been alive. Maybe it had gone into the next morning, or maybe it was that evening. Either way, Alice was eventually strangled with some kind of cloth. We can assume that he had attempted to use Emily as some kind of like bargaining chip or, or something, and then that just didn't work out because later he drove the three of them out to a nearby wooded area and dug two shallow graves, one for Ernie and one for the girls. Once they were in the dirt, he sprinkled lye over their bodies to help speed up decomposition, and then he filled it in. Now, having been banished from his home because of his estranged wife's restraining order, he went back to the Brendel's home. Using Ernie's computer, he forged a letter to the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission retracting the complaint that had been filed against him. There's some reports that he forced Alice to do this. Either way, there was a forged letter. And then he took the Brendel's checkbook and wrote himself a check for $1,500. Okay, so after he killed the Brendel's, Christopher Hightower went to Ernie's sister's house and told her the story about the kidnapping and right, whatever, Christine called the FBI and now we're all caught up. So the FBI first reached out to the Guilford Police Department, Christine's local police, and then they made a call to the Barrington Police Department who dispatched an officer to 51 Middle Highway, the Brendel's home. There was no vehicle in the driveway and no lights on in the house. He wanted to preserve evidence, so uh, investigators arrived pretty quickly after that. So after looking over the house, there was no like obvious signs of trouble, like nothing was obviously missing, the house hadn't been ransacked, nothing really out of place, except the garage did have a strange hole in the wall and some signs of cleanup. Police would later say that if it weren't for Christopher going to Ernie's sister house to demand this ransom on behalf of the mob, nobody would have connected him to this. But since good old Christopher decided to hit up Ernie's sister for money, he became very interesting to police. Dumb dumb Christopher, he wasn't on the run, no. He was still driving around in Ernie's car 
with his blood in it. Just running errands like it's any other day. On the afternoon of Monday, September 23rd, Christopher Hightower was arrested while driving Ernie Brendel's red Toyota. When they searched him, they found $1,500 in cash, and inside the car, they found, you know, that crazy quantity of blood and a half bag of lye, a crossbow, and three teeth. They later confirmed that those were Ernie's teeth. Well, Christopher claimed that his good friend Ernie had let him sleep over on Thursday and Friday night because he was having marital problems. So of course his prints were all over the house. He also claimed that Ernie was loaning him that car to drive around. He went into that mob story about the kidnapping, but this time with one change, obviously his wife and kids are not kidnapped. He made up that part to make Ernie's family not feel alone in this ordeal. Well, investigators searched for the Brendels for weeks, but it didn't look very promising. In fact, Ernie's family held a memorial service for the three of them. They knew that they were gone. On November 7th, 1991, on November 7th, 1991, a woman was walking her dog near St. Andrew's School in Barrington when her dog like ran off into the bushes. When she followed after the dog, she discovered two depressions in the ground with like some strange white powder, shallow graves. When they brought out an excavation crew, they found that on top there had been a layer of lye and there was even a small corner of the bag, the lye bag, that was in the hole matching the bag in the car. So in one grave was Ernie, you know, his legs were bent at the knees and it was very clear that he had been shot with several arrows, bolts. The autopsies confirmed the causes of death. Ernie shot, Alice strangled, and Emily had been buried alive. So apparently when Christopher sedated her with that Benadryl, he didn't give her enough for her to have overdosed. She was breathing when he put her in that grave and she likely aspirated and smothered. Following the discovery of those bodies, Christopher Hightower was indicted and went to trial. Now, all that time, Christopher actually had been in jail, but not for the murders or kidnapping. He was originally charged with attempted extortion, illegal possession of a firearm. They had found a sawed off shotgun in his office, stealing a car, well, so Grand Theft Auto and stolen credit cards. Now that they had these bodies, they could add three counts of murder and kidnapping. So Christopher never confessed, but he did tell the court all kinds of creative stories. He said he was insane, not true. Ernie was dealing heroin and that was part of it too, not true. He testified against his lawyer's advice that he actually witnessed the murders at the hands of four unknown mobster types. Also not true. Now, when he was on the stand, he like really got into it. I couldn't believe it. It was impossible. You don't kill the child. Lots and lots of details, just like made up fairy tale bullshit stories. Things to like distract you from all of these real issues. You know, he's got a long pattern of deceit and an undeniable motive to kill Ernie Brendel. Well, the prosecution's case presented all the receipts, like literally like the receipt for the crossbow. They had a concise timeline all the way from Friday, the last time that anybody saw or heard from Ernie, all the way to Monday when Christopher was arrested. In the end, the jury did find Christopher Hightower guilty on all counts. And there were a lot in this case, you know, not just murder, kidnapping, there was fraud, Yada, yada, yada. On June 8th, 1991, Christopher Hightower was sentenced to serve three life sentences without the possibility of parole. Shortly after beginning to serve this prison term, Christopher Hightower was attacked and requested to be transferred to another prison. And he has moved a few times, but the now 73 year old Christopher Hightower is serving his sentences at the Menard Correctional Facility in Southern Illinois. And that friends is the story of Christopher Hightower. <coughs> Thanks again to Caroline for this terrible story recommendation. It was terrible. <laughs> and thank you for hanging out with me today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on the other social channels as well. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye. Wibbles. No, not wibbles. Scarabine down in those scree bean those wings even
Mm -mm. Sure ain't. Screerabine. I'm not saying it right. There's a truck backing up out there. There we go. What am I doing with my hands? I don't know. 